Uh, James Carroll is going to talk to us about Thor Laser. Afternoon, everybody. Is anybody here familiar with something called low-level laser therapy? Put your hands up if you've heard of it. One or two. Amazing. It's a good half a dozen. Most of you haven't. Well, it's something you've seen on TV. You must have seen Star Trek. You know, on Star Trek, when somebody gets injured, they get taken to sickbay. The doctor gets out a laser beam. He aims it at the injury, and the patient is healed instantly. Well, we make those. <laughs> Who wants one? <laughs> okay, so it's not instant like on TV, but you get the idea. You shine light on people, and they get better. It's got this really clunky name, low-level laser therapy. Um, nobody particularly likes it, but it is the one that the National Library of Medicine here in the United States has adopted. The academics prefer photobiomodulation. Yes, much, <laughs> not a much easier name. PBM for short. Photo meaning light, bio meaning life. Modulation means we can stimulate or we can inhibit. And it's the application of monochromatic light. That means light of one color. So my, uh, my lecture pointer is one color. It's red. It's 650 nanometers. And you have the right, if you have the right wavelength, and if you have the right intensity, and you apply it at the right place for the right amount of time, the right intervals, you can increase the speed and quality of tissue repair. You can reduce inflammation and edema, and we can induce an analgesic effect. Most of the published clinical work, and I'm talking about double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trials published in proper medical journals, most of the data is around sprains and strains and creaky joints, uh, side effects from chemotherapy like oral mucositis, uh, neuropathic pain like shingles, post neuralgia, trigeminal neuralgia, non-healing wounds like diabetic wounds, venous ulcers, pressure sores, lymphedema, primary lymphedema, post-mastectomy lymphedema, and a range of sort of dental pathologies or uh, just after orthodontics, so it speeds up the rate of movement of teeth and reduces orthodontic pain. Here's our device. It's a control unit that has different accessories that do different jobs. It's got FDA clearance. It's got a CE mark. It's got a TGA in Australia. It's got a Health Canada mark as well. And it's applied to the patient like this. So here we have a patient whose neck's being treated. There's an example of a tennis elbow a kid who's going through chemotherapy, having his uh, ulceration treated, and a patient who has neuropathic pain, they're squirting light into the stellate ganglion that has the same effect as a lidocaine block. Well, how does it do this? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Let's start by saying it's not a heat therapy. It's more like photosynthesis in plants because humans will photosynthesize. So, you know, when you go out in the sun, you change color. We use light to help synthesize vitamin D. They might use blue light on neonatal jaundice. A, a dermatologist might use ultraviolet light on psoriasis and vitiligo. So you shouldn't be surprised if light has some other effects on the body. Now, I know you, you probably think that lasers and medicine are for cutting and ablating and cauterizing, you know, and generally burning things. And, well, the good news is not all lasers are dangerous. Some are more dangerous than others. That's because there's different classes of lasers. There's the ones you're familiar with in supermarkets up the top. There are class one lasers. They're inherently safe. You can look at those all day. At the other end of the scale, the ones you're familiar with in medicine, these are the ones that have thermal effects. They cut and they blade and they cauterize. We use class 3B lasers. They have no harmful effects on skin or clothing, though they are potentially hazardous to the eye, so you shouldn't stare at them, and you should wear laser safety glasses. We also use light-emitting diodes, LEDs. They have some similar qualities. So now there's over 400 double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trials and over 4,000 laboratory studies uh, and about 30 new papers a month being published in this field in some of the journals you might have heard of. It's been in the Lancet, the British Medical Journal, it's data published by the International Association for Study of Pain, as a World Health Organization paper, which ends up with a recommendation for low-level laser therapy for neck pain. So let's have a look at some of the sort of exciting sort of futuristic aspects of this, and then we'll come back down to Earth and talk about some normal applications. So some of the more exciting places we're going, um, this is work done by Uri Oron in Tel Aviv, 
and the left you see a heart, uh, well, they're both hearts after a heart attack. The heart attack's been induced by they've clamped the coronary artery, they've stopped the blood flowing in. Then when they unclamp it, the blood rushes into the heart and it causes something called ischemic shock, and that leads to all that scar tissue that you see. Unless you're a lucky rat, in which case you get a laser treatment on the, on the right there, and as you can see, there's all that reperfusion following two treatments with a laser, one immediately after, another three days later, and that's through the chest wall of a rat. This is a mouse study. This is for traumatic brain injury. This is the leading cause of death and disability for American children and young adults. This could be falling off a skateboard or a bicycle, could be being involved in a road traffic accident. It can be a, a sort of a, an accumulation of mild injuries to the head, and things just get worse, playing NFL, for example. This particular study is a controlled cortical impact model. They're giving a bang on the brain, very carefully controlled. They all have exactly the same injury, and then they have to do these tests, run across beams, hanging on the wires, climbing up ladders, that kind of thing. Some of them get a laser treatment. And you can see the light bars at the end of that uh, list of error bars there showing the much significantly reduced uh, motor deficits following a single laser treatment to the brain four hours after injury. There's a lot more to tell you, but I can't today. We don't have time, but I'll take you back to this heart problem. It's all very well treating a rat through the heart, through the, through the chest wall. It doesn't work on humans. We're a lot bigger. Our lungs are substantially in the way. How did Uri overcome that problem? He had this idea about making the body generate more stem cells. So he projected light through the tibia of some rats to see if he could stimulate the bone marrow to make more mesenchymal stem cells, and it worked. Next question. Do these mesenchymal stem cells find their way to an infarcted heart? Yes, they do. First bar shows that's a control group. Second bar shows the number of mesenchymal cells in a heart after a direct laser treatment to the heart through the chest wall. But just treating the bone marrow alone had the most profound increase, a 700% increase in the number of mesenchymal stem cells that find their way to a heart after a heart attack. Does it have any effect on infarct size? Yes, it does. In the control group, infarct size. Second bar there showing the uh, active treatment straight through the heart, through the chest wall. But treating the tibia alone had the most profound reduction in infarct size in this group. But how does it do it? I mean, this is ridiculous, isn't it? How can one thing do so many things? I've mentioned three of some of medicine's most challenging conditions, and that's just the beginning of the list. What, what could cause all of this? Because it's too good to be true, isn't it? Well, I've picked things which all have the same challenge. And the, the way this thing works, it all starts here. And they've all got something in common, which is oxidative stress. So this is mitochondria. And for those of you who didn't go to medical school, here's a quick introduction to the electron transport chain. So patients are made of organs, and organs are made of cells. And there's about 200 different, 250 different cell types in the body. They do different jobs. However, they have one thing in common, is they've got lots of mitochondria inside of them, and their job is to combine the food that you've eaten with the air that you breathe. So you will breathe in air, the oxygen attaches to hemoglobin, gets passed around the body, finds its way to every cell in the body. We eat food, we digest it, it breaks down, gets passed into the bloodstream in the form of glucose and fats, finds its way to every cell in the body. Goes, both these go through the membrane. There's a little process called glycolysis, makes a little bit of the cellular energy, ATP. And you can see up here, you get two ATPs from one glucose molecule, but you also make, the glycolysis makes one uh, pyruvate as well, which is used by mitochondria and combined with oxygen to make most of your cellular energy, 36 ATPs. That's where we get most of our cellular energy from. But when we get sick, when we get stressed, as we get old, something goes wrong in mitochondria. Mitochondria starts to make a gas called nitric oxide, and it competes with oxygen. So there we go. It competes with oxygen and competitively displaces oxygen from uh, cytochrome C oxidase, the terminal enzyme in the electron transport chain. So you stop making the essential cellular energy ATP. And worse than that, you get a sort of electron back, pre um, sort of back pressure. It's all constipated system. You make superoxide and hydrogen peroxide, leaks into the cytosol, triggers all those bad genes that lead to inflammation, cell death, cancer maybe, the aging process. Let me show you here. So here's a happy cell. And here we have the process of oxygen coming in and combining with NADH is what your, your food's broken down to by this point, making the essential cellular energy, ATP. But then you get sick and or stressed, or you, as you get older, you get worse at this process, and you get a buildup of these free radicals, these reactive oxygen species. And it's all because nitric oxide binds to cytochrome C oxidase. And when we put light into the patient, it 
push nitric oxide off of cytochrome C oxidase so oxygen can get back in, ATP goes up, cause of oxidative stress goes away, and your patient just gets better. So what we do, basically, is we take tissues from a state of low ATP and high oxidative stress and we move them to a state where there's more ATP and less oxidative stress. And your patient just gets better. There's a pathway which, unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about. But let me give some clinical trial examples. This is oral mucositis. There's 24 clinical trials showing that this treatment can reduce oral mucositis. So this particular study, this is a, a stem cell transplant patient, so often children with leukemia will have this. This is where they might lose all the skin inside their mouth, all the way down to their anus, have to be fed by tube for months. But if we apply this treatment, it shows here the light bars represent the patients who are in a placebo group, and most of them, these are the five grades of oral mucositis, most of them are in the high grades of oral mucositis in the placebo group. The active group in the dark bars you see are in the low grades of oral mucositis. And this is to do with survival after, after this procedure. So after this treatment, it appears that the patients actually survive longer as well, though this is a small patient study. It's only 38. But there's 24 clinical trials showing that this effect consistently happens in uh, head and neck cancer patients after radiotherapy as well as um, high-dose chemotherapy as well. So here's some real patient photographs showing oral mucositis before and after, radiation dermatitis before and after, and dry mouth. Can you imagine that? Not being able to make saliva for the rest of your life? This is, people, this is what people suffer from. And it's led to the Multinational Association for Supportive Cancer Care giving this a recommendation statement so that every cancer patient under high-dose chemotherapy or radiotherapy should be having this treatment. Other examples of healing, uh, this gentleman here is diabetic. He's had a uh, post-operative wound that wouldn't heal. And showing here, oh, I was hoping the video would have started by now. Yes. So, and here he's going to get a treatment. There it is healed, but he's had this wound. It wouldn't heal for up to a year in this case. There it is, non-healed for, for a year, gets a treatment, and a few weeks later, it's healed. There's controlled trials on all forms of non-healing wounds. This is a diabetic foot ulcer study showing improved healing compared with a control group. And by the way, it actually works on tigers as well. Anyway, neck pain. Neck pain, who here has neck pain? Yeah, that's fairly typical. About 25% of you, that's normal. You're going to be likely to be treated with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for this, and they don't work. So there we have a treatment which is regenerative, anti-inflammatory, it's analgesic, it works for acute and chronic pathologies, it's consistently more effective than NSAIDs, there's no side effects, it works, it's, the devices work for years so they're very cheap, there's potential for home use as well. So I think this is going to play an important role in global health. But there is just one more thing. Dry age-related macular degeneration. There is no proven effective cure, and it is the leading cause of blindness in the developed world. Here showing when you get AMD, life goes a bit fuzzy in the middle as your central vision goes down. You lose contrast sensitivity, the world goes a bit black and white. You start developing geographic atrophy, so you develop these blind spots, and within 10 years you go blind. And there is no proven effective cure. So there's about 10 million sufferers in the USA now, 22 million by 2020, about 200 million by, uh, in the world and it costs about $100 billion a year at the moment. And treatments for the wet form will cost about 36,000 over two years. We've, I'm a co-founder of a new company called Lumithera, and we've already treated 11 patients and 22 eyes, and we have brought them at least 86% made it to one line of improvement, 45% made it to two lines, 31% made it to three lines, and 13% made it to four lines of improvement. We have a prototype device we need funding for, We've done another ATIs not in the trial. We've got issued and pending patents. Here's a patient being treated. It's another animal. Here we go. And so you, what we have here is a regenerative treatment. It's anti-inflammatory. It slows progression. It's non-invasive. It's very low cost. Works where other treatments don't work. It's going to be a class two device, non-significant risk. We can get a 510K application for this. There's a pipeline of other treatments. We've got, just been granted $250,000 by a Washington LSDF grant. We're seeking $10 million, and we're projecting uh, commercialization within three years. And if you're interested, you can come and meet this gentleman down here, Clark Tedford, who's our CEO of that business. Thank you very much.